Hey everybody, it's Mr. Robbins back again to continue our discussion of period 8. And today, in today's video, we're going to kind of be moving forward into the next decade and the final decade covered in period 8, the 1970s. So in a lot of ways, the 70s are going to kind of show us the impacts of the massive changes that were ongoing during the 60s and how these, in many cases, did make life better for a lot of Americans, but in some cases maybe made things worse. Um, and we'll get into that over the next several videos as we wrap up uh, the period. Um, but today, uh, we are going to pick up with a couple topics that are kind of directly linked to what we talked about happening in the 60s. The first, uh, dealing with um, uh, kind of a continuation of the uh, civil rights movement in the way with a series of, of minority liberation movements. And then the next, similarly, continuing the issue of kind of civil rights and equality, but no longer between races and ethnic groups, but with the second wave of feminism. And so, in a lot of ways, what I'm about to talk about now probably would not have come to the fore or would have seen the success that it uh, that they would have without the um, advent and success of the African-American Civil Rights Movement. But, because now we're talking about different groups of people, we're going to be not just be talking about different groups of people, but different problems that are unique to them uh, that also need to be addressed in broader society. So, let's go ahead and get into it. Now, as I mentioned, you know, obviously some of the biggest problems we had in the country at the time of the late uh, 50s and 60s, a lot of it had to do with civil rights for African Americans. There's no real secret behind that. Hopefully that was something you gathered pretty strongly from what we've talked about in the past few videos. And there were many different folks involved in that civil rights movement. It was, it was maybe on the behalf of African American issues, but wasn't only participated in by African Americans, it was participated in by many other groups. But as we see their successes uh, pile up and you know, we get more and more movement towards equality, particularly after the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, those act as an inspiration to the groups I'm about to talk about to kind of pick up their own mantle and kind of push forward equality in their neck of the woods. So I'm going to uh, drill down into some specific groups uh, in this, Native Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans, and uh, gay folks, LGBT folks in the United States um, that are all going to kind of broadly speaking going to be fighting for civil rights for themselves but when you get down to the details, we're going to see that means like different things and different tactics depending on the group. Now, the first I want to talk about are Native Americans. Now, they're not necessarily a new topic for us in this class. And you can go back to my early videos from the beginning of the, of the school year. And, you know, we're talking a lot about Native Americans. But let's just be frank. Um, I haven't talked a lot about Native Americans since... Uh, those early days of class, I do remember, and part of our lecture notes was talking about how the New Deal reorganized things for Native Americans and kind of undid some of the actions uh, during the Gilded Age uh, in the reservation system, uh, most notably the Dawes Act uh, from uh, that kind of broke up a lot of the tribal loyalties. But honestly, this is a threat that has been overshadowed by so many other things going on uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century that it's just not like the big one of the big focuses for you know whatever reason. And that wasn't lost on Native Americans in the 1970s either. Now, let's be clear. It's not a huge group of people. We're talking about 800,000 people across the country. For the most part, kind of centered in the kind of central part of the Great Plains in the West where most of the native reservations would be. But even though it's a small group, it does not mean that there are not significant problems. And especially when we start looking like proportionally at these problems, and so we look at like 
what are like the rates of poverty and the rates of like drug and alcohol abuse and the rates of like violent crime. And when you look at reservations in places like Oklahoma and elsewhere in the West, per capita, so that means what you deal with the fact that there are fewer people living there, their per capita rates of, like I said, drug and alcohol abuse, poverty, homicides, other violent crimes like rape, like there are more of those happening on a per capita basis on many of these reservations than in a big city like New York City, right? The absolute number is much bigger in New York City because millions of people just live in that one city alone. But when you adjust for the fact that, you know, when you adjust for per capita basis, like the rate is higher. That's insane. And that was true in the 70s. And to be quite frank, it's still mostly true today in the 2020s, 50 years on. And this is what's going to spur Native Americans to begin their activism along with the example of the African American Civil Rights Movement. Now, it really begins in 1968 when the uh, group AIM, the American Indian Movement, is founded. Now, this is uh, based on the concept of red power, which today is kind of a funny way to talk about it, uh, but it kind of connects to the black power ideology in a way. Uh, but it's not really something we would see widely used today. Uh, kind of the, the, it's weird to mention them by their colors, but... It was common at the time. Um, but that there is a real connection there because a lot of what they're influenced by is not the kind of nonviolent civil disobedience of the early civil rights era, but what we saw emerge uh, near the end of the 1960s, and we talked about in the last video, the Black Power Movement. Now, we are going to see protests. And in these, they're going to do not only some things that are illegal, they're going to do some pretty pretty serious acts, like in the year 1969, when a group of AIM members uh, will go and occupy uh, Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay. Here it is in 1969, a photo of them outside of the compound. Now, by this point, Alcatraz, which you probably know, famous, uh, famous prison, Al Capone was there for some of his time in prison in the 30s and 40s. Um, by this point, it had been decommissioned, so no longer was an operating prison. Um, but it was a federal piece of land, and the AIM members that did this, they explicitly said they were like taking back their land taking back their land because Alcatraz Island, much like the rest of San Francisco and the rest of California and the rest of all of the United States, was at one point the land of some native tribe that lived there. Now, this is almost two years, 19 months, you know, year, over a year and a half of a protest that they do. It is armed. It's an armed protest, right? Um, so it's not necessarily completely peaceful, um, but uh, it does draw a lot of attention to the issue. And we see that more Native Americans, that are, or the, uh, many Native Americans that see this action, they want to help participate and kind of push this movement forward. Now, a few years later, in February of 1973, an even perhaps more dramatic uh, protest occurs, and this uh, importantly happens at the site of Wounded Knee, the Wounded Knee Massacre that we talked about um, back in period six during the Gilded Age, the infamous 1890 massacre where 200, perhaps 300 uh, Sioux Indians were killed by uh, the U.S. Cavalry. At that point, still in the early 70s, though, this was more called and still called by historians the Battle of Wounded Knee instead of what we usually called it in this class and what we usually call it today, the Wounded Knee Massacre. Um, now, not only are they drawing attention to like that historic connection, there's no, no mistake why they chose that place to do their, their protest, it also is to try and get changes on the reservation that Rolling Duny was located on, Pine Ridge, and kind of how it is administrated and what occurs. 
Now, we see that there are going to be some, some concrete outcomes and beneficial outcomes for Native Americans. Uh, one example would happen uh, shortly after uh, this protest at Wounded Knee with Nixon pass, uh, Nixon's administration signing the Indian Education Act, which would provide funds for new schools on the reservations that, uh, while paid for through the federal government, will be directly administered and controlled by the tribes to, to operate as they see fit. Okay? Um, and we see kind of open of, of more benefits to, to Native Americans. Uh, today, uh, the federal government will pay basically the full ride of tuition for uh, uh, a Native living on a reservation if they get into a college, a four-year university or whatever, or something like that. Um, however, while they do have some positive change, as I mentioned, still a lot of problems of poverty and drug and alcohol addiction and violent crime on the reservations that still today make them, you know, not, not the best places to live. So not all the problems of Native Americans in the United States are fixed through these protests. Moving on to the next group, Hispanic Americans. Now, um, this group, and I'm using this term Hispanic because at this time, most of the folks that are immigrants from uh, places in Central and South America, or in the case of some folks, longtime citizens of the United States that happened to live in the Southwest when we acquired it in the 1840s, uh, we would consider them Hispanic, okay? Um, as the name implies, this means that they are uh, at, on some level, Spanish speakers. They lived in a part of the world that was uh, colonized by the Spanish during the age of colonization. Um, when we talk about the term uh, Latinx or Latin uh, or Latin America, you're kind of widening the net a little bit because uh, technically, like people from Brazil, they are Latin American, but they are not Hispanic because they were founded by the Portuguese. You get it, right? Uh, but in this time period, the, the large preponderance are going to be of Hispanic background, which is why it's appropriate to use in this context. And if you use that, it's okay. Um, now, at this point in the 70s, uh, we had a lot of different uh, uh, groups of, of Hispanic Americans in the country. Um, folks from Puerto Rico would be Hispanic, and Puerto Rico had been part of uh, the United States, at least as a territory, since uh, the 1890s. Cuba, a lot of migrants uh, out of Cuba after the Communist Revolution in the 50s. Um, so people kind of came here as refugees, a lot of them in places like South Florida, Central America, uh, uh, places like Guatemala, Nicaragua, and then uh, Mexico, right? And that's probably one of the biggest single group Okay, and perhaps a, at that time, a majority of the Hispanic Americans were of Mexican descent either way back, like from like the 19th century, or fairly recent immigrants. Um, uh, in 1960, uh, about uh, 3 million Hispanic uh, Americans were, were counted in the census. Uh, by 1970, that was up to 9.6 million, and by up to 14.5 million in 1980, and that's a number that has continued to grow uh, past the 1980s. Now, as you uh, might expect, um, because this is at least partially still true today, many of these Hispanic Americans, not all of them, but many of them are working in, in pretty tough jobs. Uh, and many, but not all of these tough jobs are going to be in the agricultural sector. Uh, and they are absolutely vital to American agriculture, not only in the 70s, but till today, um, because uh, that is very important work that does not get paid very well, but is integral to having, you know, food in the grocery stores and food on our dinner tables, right? Um, but Simply put, that means that a lot of these Hispanic Americans are more or less being exploited. Their labor is being exploited. And one particular area of focus out in the West was an area of the California Central Valley, Delano, California. At that point uh, in the 70s, 
about half of all of the world's supply of table grapes, so those are the ones that you just eat like as grapes, right? So they're not used for wine or other things, juice or whatever, like they're for eating. Uh, half of all the grapes produced for that purpose in the world came from this community in uh, California. And the vast majority of the workers who picked those grapes for harvest were Hispanic Americans. Now, we see, partially inspired through the African American Civil Rights Movement, a couple of activists and um, agricultural workers themselves, Cesar Chavez, who you see up above, he's in that black and white photo up there, and Dolores Huerta will found the National Farm Workers Association. You don't really need to remember that group and that acronym. The one I really want you to remember is what eventually this group came to be called the United Farm Workers, or UFW. That's the one to remember, okay? Now, over time, this group would grow to represent thousands of workers in these great vineyards. And by uh, the mid-1960s, they have enough workers uh, from these agricultural communities in and around Delano to organize a strike for better pay, better working conditions, better hours. Okay, um, And this was a big thing because those growers, they didn't even recognize the right of the UFW to organize and to even exist. So this is a big push that they're trying to make and a lot of hurdles to overcome. Now, Chavez himself, he was very much influenced by Dr. King and his nonviolent tactics. And so he will, and probably more than, than most of these other leaders of other minority liberation movements, will kind of copy and emulate these nonviolent tactics, one of which uh, that was a remarkably set success for Chavez was a hunger strike, where he went on a hunger strike for about four weeks, becoming extremely weak and ill, and there were some points that folks worried about his health and if he would survive this hunger strike, but even during that, he's doing protest march marches, uh, he's going on the media and calling for a national boycott of grapes uh, to hit these grape producers right in their pocket. And all of this pressure together um, was successful. The boycott grew to about 17 million consumers. The, the grapes, uh, uh, their demand went down sharply. And this was enough for the grape growers and landowners to say, fine, fine. And they signed a contract recognizing the UFW and their right to organize as a labor union. Now, of course, you know, this is not just uh, 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 a situation of, for Hispanic Americans. It's also kind of a labor issue as well. But the kind of social issues that affected Hispanic Americans in many different uh, forms of work, because not all, again, all of them are agricultural workers, grew from this. And as we saw, similarly to the uh, Black Power movement, by the end of the decade, more uh, Mexican American uh, uh, immigrants and uh, descendants will become more radical as well. Um, in 1969, a group of, of Mexican American students would meet in Denver, about 1,500 of them to come up with like this new conception of a much more aggressive uh, political and cultural agenda. Now, at this uh, meeting, uh, these folks would uh, proclaim a new term, uh, Chicano. Uh, by this, this would be the uh, this would reference specifically um, descendants of Mexican Americans. So it's not synonymous with uh, Hispanic. Um, but this word Chicano um, is not the only word, that, uh, the only thing that comes out of this meeting. They also call for the organization of a political party, uh, La Raza Unita, or what's usually called La Raza, right? The race uh, in Espanol. Um, now, what this group would do um, is act as a pressure group, uh, push for goals. Uh, that were sought by Mexican Americans and then other Hispanic Americans as well, like bilingual education programs. Uh, still at this point in parts of the West where the largest 
uh, uh, Spanish-speaking populations were located at the time, everything was only taught in English. Like there was no like English as a second language program. If you were a kid and you were still forced to go to school, but you didn't know English that well, like tough cookie, you were just going to deal with it. Uh, that will uh, the the pressure from La Raza and other Chicanos will help kind of push that along. Uh, first in the West, and then it, uh, eventually these practices go nationwide. And then on the collegiate level, looking into Chicano Mexican American study programs in college to kind of focus on these issues at a uh, level at higher education. The next one I want to talk about, gay Americans, okay? Now, of course, today we're going to be more talking about, like, the term LGBTQ, and then, of course, there are some formulations of that that are much wider. However, this is a group of folks that we really haven't talked about in this class yet in any real way. Now, um, is that because gay people, LGBT folks, didn't exist before, like, the 1960s? No, they did. They've existed basically in like every part of history that we have uh, written down and then all the other parts of history that we don't have written down. But it's all, if you look at historical records, very speculative, right? Like when a, a guy was uh, unmarried for most of their lives, you know, a public figure, they call him a confirmed bachelor, which was like, Low key meant that he was probably homosexual, but you know, obviously wouldn't be proven. Would definitely be scandalous to make that accusation publicly, but people could kind of read what that meant. However, by the 1960s, this situation is starting to change, and more and more uh, uh, lesbians and gay folks and bisexuals and transgender folks are living out of the closet, meaning they are open about their sexual and gender orientations. That was new. And it was a tough time because as far as the medical establishment went, um, being gay was considered a mental illness at the beginning of the 1960s. And as far as the law went, most states across the United States made it illegal to commit homosexual acts. Like, you could actually be put in jail for having uh, homosexual sexual relations. Like, literally. Um, now, uh, this made it where, and this wasn't new for the 60s either, that these groups of folks, who obviously, for the most part, are acting underground, are being harassed by the police in large numbers. Uh, gay men and lesbians, especially at the time, but other folks that also didn't kind of fit the norm. Now, one such kind of vice raid occurred in New York City in the summer of 1969 at the Stonewall Inn. Now, the Stonewall Inn uh, was not like publicly advertised as such, but it had basically become a gay bar. Um, it happily served uh, LGBT folks, especially gay men, um, and, you know, it became kind of a safe space for them in a city that was fairly hostile to them still at the time, but the NYPD did something that they had done in many other cases, and, and on this night in June of 1969, they raided the Stonewall Inn and uh, tried to arrest several of the bar goers for uh, immoral acts um, under the law, but um, it didn't necessarily go exactly the way the NYPD thought it was going to go. Uh, a kind of spontaneous protest occurred as the bar goers and then others around started to like gather and throw stuff at the cops. Um, the uh, the cops uh, had to kind of retreat as like things really got dicey and. All of a sudden, there's now this backlash from the LGBT community to the harassment they've been dealt with, not just in this particular in instance, but for decades. And this is the genesis of the modern, what they call, gay liberation movement. Now, within a year, by the next year, 1970, the first ever gay pride parade is held in New York City. 
Now, these are something that, you know, are kind of ubiquitous today. Pretty much every big city has one, usually during the month of June, uh, to represent that anniversary of, of the Stonewall Inn. Um, and it is usually a march where, where gay folks, lesbian folks, bisexual folks, transgender, non-gender conforming, uh, queer, and so on, they, they participate in this and be open and be seen in their communities. Um, it starts in 1970 in New York, and then uh, we see that these organizations spread beyond that big city, and there are about 800 gay organizations across the country by 1973. Now, what are their victories? Well, I mentioned what the medical establishment talked about, about LGBT folks. Uh, by 1973, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses. So no longer were you considered to be mentally ill if you love someone of the same sex. Uh, four years later, in 1977, uh, the first ever openly gay uh, politician uh, wins public office in, uh, in San Francisco, California. Harvey Milk will sit uh, on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, um, making, and he was openly gay, uh, making him the first. Uh, Harvey Milk, uh, of course, sadly, uh, would be assassinated a few years later, uh, not, not directly because he was gay, uh, but it was a small part of it. Um, but uh, he's still kind of an iconic and important historic figure because being that first. But there is one other group we need to talk about, and this is not one that's new to us women in America. Um, but what is new is this push of a second wave of feminism as we enter the late 60s and 70s. Now, we kind of previewed a little bit of this stuff uh, when we were talking about the 1950s and conformity, um, but let's just review it a little bit. So, by the early 60s, um, it, it was thought on average that the average housewife spent something like 55 hours a week on domestic chores, so more than a full-time job. What are those chores? You know, cooking, cleaning, doing dishes child care, so on and so forth, okay? And for those of y'all that help in your family with chores, hopefully all of you do as, you know, 16 and 17-year-olds, but I digress, um, you should know that that stuff is, it's a lot of work, and it's frankly sometimes very tedious and boring and not intellectually stimulating, Um but if you're doing it like as a full-time job, I mean, some folks are going to be happy with that and kind of content in that. But as one researcher, Betty Friedan, kind of bore out in her book, The Feminine, Feminine Mystique, many women, especially college-educated women that kind of had more worldly knowledge and might even have like skill sets useful in many different professions, they felt frustrated, they felt kind of um, disappointed, they felt like, you know, depressed and bored. Now, Friedan wrote about this because it was basically her experience. That's what she experienced during the 1950s as a housewife before she divorced her husband and kind of went on her own path. Um, but Friedan talking about her experience and the data for these other housewives starts a movement. Uh, the book sells about 3 million copies and is, uh, in many cases, considered to be the genesis of the second wave of the feminist movement, focusing on the issue of gender equality, right? Now, um, it wasn't just that, though. Um, again, much like the other minority liberation movements I just talked about, like it's influenced by the African-American civil rights movement as well. It's also integrated with the anti-Vietnam War movement and these other minority liberation movements we've also talked about because this is something important. Women participated in all of those, uh, primarily black women and the African-American civil rights movement. And then we talk about, you know, the, the Native American movement aim, Native American women, right? Uh, uh, Hispanic women, uh, LGBT women, right? And so this... Um, means that uh, a lot of women are going to look at their femininity and kind of how that's 
maybe not being fully, you know, uh, given equality in our country and say, we need to fix this too. Now, this movement, though, is different. That first wave of feminism, we focused, of course, on suffrage, uh, the right to vote for women, uh, which was achieved with the 19th Amendment. But by this point, the issues are different. Women have the right to vote at this point, but there are many other things that are unequal. Uh, one would be sexual discrimination in employment. Okay, um, How would this look like? Well, uh, one, we would call what we call the pay gap, uh, where uh, men and women would earn different salaries or wages for similar, if not the exact same work. Um, this is something that's called attention to in the 70s, as you see kind of the discrepancy here in 1970, uh, median incomes for working women and men uh, are for women almost $4,000 lower, right? But you go forward to 2000, there's still a discrepancy. It's not necessarily as big, at least it is numerically, but not proportionally. Um, but this is something that has continued to to. Uh, shrink the gap between these in the past 20 years, but it's still not totally equal, um, and especially when you look at kind of higher opportunities where men hold more uh, like kind of high leadership, like CEOs and CFOs and like major corporations, that's also a part of this, this income disparity because men are more likely to get promoted to those high jobs uh, than, than women are still today. And that would be at least first called and taken into focus during this movement of, of women. Um, and especially kind of at least first addressed by Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. A couple years later, 66, a group of women, uh, uh, one of them, Betty Friedan, who will be the first president of this group, will come together to form NOW, the National Organization of Women, with the goal to, quote, bring American society, American women into full participation in the mainstream of American society now. There you go, now, right? So what does Friedan and NOW do? Uh, they will do things like um, challenge sexual discrimination in the workplace by calling attention uh, to it, in some cases, putting up the money to fund lawsuits for equal wages, the lobby companies to provide daycare for infants so women can work while also knowing their, their child care needs are being met, uh, and to bring an end to want ads in, uh, appearing in sex-segregated newspaper columns because there used to be, like, jobs for men only. Trying to get rid of that. Now... Now does see some success, but I want to be clear. There are going to be some women who say what now is looking for isn't even enough. And the problems are bigger than just discrimination in the workplace. That's a problem, but they're continually getting bigger. Now, these folks, these more radical feminists, they're generally younger, and they're going to talk about other things in society like the assumption of male supremacy, okay? And talk about how uh, this is tantamount uh, to uh, assumptions of white supremacy or to, as they said, the Negro, to black, black people, okay? Now, the uh, language is similar. They're trying to end sexism, trying to end discrimination, but they also are going to focus on women's liberation, freedom, right, from this male patriarchy. Uh, and so these more radical feminists will go a step further and talk at a high level about reproductive rights, uh, not only uh, right to access birth control, but right to access uh, medical procedures like abortions if needed, uh, uh, focus on domestic violence, uh, which uh, even in the 1970s was seen as something that was not an issue for the law to intervene in, that between a man and a wife and what happens in their home was between them. Obviously, this is something that has changed since the 1970s. And then objectification of women as sexual objects. One group of radical feminists would actually protest and boycott 
at uh, the Miss America pageant uh, due to the fact that these women are forced to dress in skiffy outfits and be objectified and sexualized um, and so on. Now, these feminists, the radicals, and the other more moderate as part of now, they do see some pretty serious success as we move into the 1970s. Uh, the first I will talk about is in the uh, 1972 Higher Education Act. It's what we call Title IX. And this is something that you uh, have probably heard of because it also applies in some ways to high schools and other uh, public schools, grade schools. Um, Title IX, broadly speaking, is about providing equal opportunity to women in both admissions into colleges, athletics, but also in like treatment and discrimination. Well, probably one of the most visible impacts from Title IX will be on collegiate sports, right? Now, before this happened in 1972, only about 15% of women actually participated in intercollegiate sports. And the reason why is that most colleges had limited, if any, women's sporting uh, clubs on their campuses. Most of the schools had football teams and basketball teams and some of the others, but they had a lot fewer female athletes because that's just what made sense. People paid to come to ba uh, football and basketball games, so they kind of pay for themselves in a way if they don't make money for the university. Title IX will change that. And what it requires is that colleges provide an equal number of scholarships to male students and to female students to reach that equality. Now, this uh, means that uh, some schools, and you see here a graph from uh, 2004 and 2005, this is probably pretty much the same today with maybe slightly different numbers. Uh, but this says, shows us uh, kind of how these sports teams operate. Essentially how they work is that in almost every big school, football and or basketball makes most of the money, but the athletic department mostly loses money on women's sports because the ticket prices, I mean, not people don't buy them as much. People don't want to go to see gymnastics meets as often as they want to go to football games. But because of this federal legislation, uh, colleges are forced to offer these other uh, sports for women, like gymnastics, like volleyball, like softball, uh, in order to give those equal opportunities. Now, w the other thing that's probably even better known and very, very controversial uh, still today uh, is the Roe v. Wade case in 1973. Now, um, the basic story here... Um, the uh, woman uh, called Jane Rowe, which is a pseudonym, like to keep her identity uh, safe. Uh, her real name was Norma McCorvey. She just recently passed away a couple years ago. Um, she wanted to access an abortion for an unwanted child in the state of Texas. Uh, but Texas, as many other states around the country at that time, made any form of abortion illegal. So women that got them in the early 20th century often did so illegally um, through unlicensed doctors who obviously did not use, you know, sanitary techniques that caused a lot of problems and complications and deaths of these women that sought out abortions. Roe wanted to access one legally, but she couldn't. So she sued uh, the state, uh, sued uh, the uh, um, sued the, the uh, attorney in charge in Dallas County, um, Roger Wade. So he's the Wade for the right to access an abortion. Now, before this case actually made it all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, Roe did you know have the child. Um, but in the end, the story is much bigger than her narrow story uh, because once this case made it to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court made a very pivotal decision. And they said that abortions, like other medical procedures, are an issue of privacy, meaning that they are between the person getting the procedure and the person's operating the procedure. 
And while there's not an explicit right to privacy in our Constitution or Bill of Rights, the Supreme Court argued that through interpretation of other amendments and kind of looking at them in totality, First Amendment rights to free speech and assembly, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Fourth Amendment rights to uh, 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 protection from searches and seizures, and Fifth Amendment rights to due process, and, and so on and so forth, that there was at least an implied right to privacy in the Bill of Rights, which meant that this uh, situation of getting abortion could not be made illegal by the states. And therefore, all abortion laws up through a certain point would be made invalid across the states. Now, we will see in the years to come, states would uh, uh, find uh, ways and kind of challenge the law. In some ways, the court kind of walked this back in, in minor ways. Uh, like, as for example, today, um, most uh, uh, abortions in the third trimester of a pregnancy what we would call a late-term abortion, the last three months of the pregnancy, are not legal in most parts of the United States. Um, and it's something that still today states are actively trying to limit even more without completely outlawing abortion, uh, because that does still violate what the Supreme Court set in 73. Now, I'm going to be honest with this one. This is probably one of the most controversial things that we have reason to talk about in U.S. history, it's not really my job to tell you what to think about this because generally speaking, regardless of what side one is on, if one feels strongly about this, kind of both sides feel very strongly about it. Uh, it's more about talking about what the controversy is and how uh, some folks, you know, especially feminists, want this right, but then more conservative folks, especially uh, very religious folks and religious institutions themselves are very wholeheartedly against this as uh, abortion because they see it um, in their eyes as the murder of a living being. Um, again, it's not my job to tell you what to think about that, just that it is a t continued topic of conversation 50 years after the Roe case. Now, there's some other successes outside of that. Employment is one of them. Uh, we start to see in the 70s large numbers of women going into primarily male-dominated industries like being firefighters or railroad industry engineers, airline pilots, construction workers. We even start to see women holding high elected office in the United States. One example would be Ella Grasso, who would become the first woman to be elected governor of a state when she becomes the governor of, of Connecticut. Uh, in the, during the 70s, the five military academies for the different service branches will be uh, required to enroll women. Um, and by 1980, there are almost no male colleges remaining. They're all mostly co-ed, and then there are some that are still for women only. Um, as one student put it, uh, life is co-ed, meaning co-educational for guys and girls. School should be also. Makes sense to me. Now, those successes, though, are not where feminists want to stop. There is one thing that people in uh, now, the more moderate folks, and then the more radical feminists all want. And they want a clear affirmation of the equal rights of women, not just in a form of a law, but in the form of a constitutional amendment that would amend our Constitution and kind of enshrine equality for men and women into the law. Now, Congress in 1972 will pass language for an equal rights amendment to be added to the Constitution. Now, this amendment said, quote, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Now, the way that a constitutional amendment becomes law, or at least one of the ways, is that these amendments can be passed by Congress, and then they have to be ratified by uh, three-fourths of state legislators, mm -hmm. legislatures. Now, that would mean that out of the 50 states at that time, we would need 38 out of 50 to agree to it for this to be formally added to the United States Constitution forever. The ERA gets through state legislatures pretty quickly, about 35 
of them, meaning that they're shy just about three. And if three states uh, would uh, take up this amendment and pass it, it would become part of the Constitution. But that is not what happened. Uh, opponents of the Equal Rights Amendment, led by, yes, a woman, Phyllis Schlafly, you see her right here above me, will organize against the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, why? Well, Shafley would talk about the kind of uniquely uh, woman, womanly like things that like help protect women. Uh, things like the draft, like women, women are not, they can't be drafted as the law states then and now, um, but men can. Um, you know, kind of rights to be a homemaker, which weren't like established rights, but she thought like, or, or argue at least that those may be uh, taken away if women, you know, got this equal rights amendment. Regardless of the arguments, the pushback from conservatives like Shafley is successful. Um, and they stop the last few states from considering the bill. A uh, few states try to hear it in their state legislatures, but it fails. And it's defeated. The ERA did have a time limit, and you had to have these 38 states agree to it within the certain time limit. And many states wait out the clock, including our home state of Georgia. Okay, But it's not just southern states. It's some western states, Illinois and the Midwest, don't ratify uh, the, 38 to, uh, or the ERA, uh, so not hitting to 38. But if any one of those tan ones had done it, three of them, uh, it would have been. Now, in more recent years, uh, the question has come up of, like, okay, things have changed a lot since the 70s. Places like Virginia and Georgia uh, and Illinois have got even more liberal in some ways. And, like, so uh, it's more possible the ERA could be passed through these state legislatures. However, and this just happened very recently, uh, it was affirmed that that time limit has to be held to. And so now, to get another Equal Rights Amendment, even with the same language, you would have to start all over again from scratch, and while it's probably more likely it would get added to the Constitution, today our politics is, you know, so adversarial and so polarized, it, it may also not be successful. Now, to wrap up talking about women, I want to talk about some of the statistical uh, connections that we can make and kind of ways we can show, like, how things are changing for women for sure, well, sorry, uh, by looking at women in two really important professions in our country, medicine and law. Now, in the beginning of the 60s, out of all the doctors in the United States, somewhere about 6% of them were women. Out of all the lawyers in the United States, something about 3% of them were women. Okay? Now, as we talked about, employment and professional opportunities were a part of the second wave of feminism, and we see a massive jump in the number of medical degree earners as we move into the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s. Now, when you actually look at like admissions rates at these professional schools, med schools, and law schools, um, major changes have occurred. Okay, um, today, uh, on average, more women are accepted to both med school and law school than men. And so what this has done is it's starting to shift things, right? Today, somewhere around one-third of all doctors and lawyers are women. But when you look at the younger uh, cohorts, the folks that kind of have become doctors and lawyers since, say, like the 2000s, it's more of an even 50-50 split, which is, you know, about equal. It's not going to be 50-50 exactly, but in that range is okay. Um, and so, given a few more years, as more of these doctors and lawyers retire and leave the profession, and we should see by, say, like the 2030s and 40s, a more even split in the amount of women and uh, men doctors as, and women and men lawyers. So this is a clear example of how um, this activism and focus on these issues really starts to create concrete change in some of the most important industries that we have, medicine and the legal field. Now, 
We're not done, though, with activism. And there's one other movement we need to talk about that's not about the rights of people, per se, but the environment, something that is very important to us today in the modern day, but wasn't something people really focused on until we got to the 70s. And so that's what we'll start off with next time, is kind of this environmental movement, what successes they saw and maybe ones that they didn't have. And then we will continue into the 70s and start talking more about the presidency of Richard Nixon, who is overseeing uh, the country as all these massive changes begin to become real. But that'll be for next time. See you then. Bye!